the mutilator Buddy Cooper will be joining us. And we also have the awesome actor who's um, been in many great films and television shows and such. And he is just an awesome guy and really talented. And we're looking forward to speaking to Nathan Basil today. I am joined today with my co-host. You have the lovely and beautiful Michelle Yeager. I said the name correct this time. Yes, you did. <laughs> we have the very talented Lucy and Toombs. Hi, everybody. And we have the great and very talented Brandon Levick. Hello. I still think I say your oh. name wrong all the time, Brandon. Uh, no, no, no. It's Levick, Levesque, however you want, man. <laughs> okay. Well, we have a great show with us today. We're going to be having Bud Cooper. from He's the director and writer of the movie The Mutilator that came out in the 80s. And we're going to be having Nathan Basil joining us later today. And he is uh, an awesome actor. Um, he did many, many things in film and television. Just a great guy. So I gave you guys your homework, and that was to watch The Mutilator and Behind the Mask. And let's see who has done that. Wait, there was two I things? I guess. <laughs> <laughs> Uh-oh. Not bad. <laughs> Why didn't Nobody told me who it is. Anyway, I think, I, think most, I think you guys saw Behind the Mask, and you guys saw The Mutilator. So, I mean, yeah. you, I remember going to a video store. Well, I was raised practically in a video store, and it was that, that picture of the three, the three hooks and... There was uh, yep, oh, there were three spikes, it. and there was people hanging up on the spikes, and then you have the the big giant hook, which uh, comes in handy later on in the film. And Michelle has been talking about that all week. Do <laughs> <laughs> <Yeah. laughs> so. you want me to say anyway, it? Anyway, <laughs> oh no, we'll talk about that later. But anyway, <laughs> what's been going on with you guys this week, Michelle? Uh, is this the lead in to where I'm supposed to do the news? <laughs> well, are you, I, actually asking, are you actually asking me what I, I'm, I'm going a, I'm asking how you're doing. How is your week going and such? I mean, we're heading well, to the news been, pretty soon. My week's actually been pretty wonderful. You know, it's good week. I've, I've, I've been getting a lot of job offers, which is always a good thing. So <laughs> That's amazing. <laughs> job offers are good. Yes, paid job off is always good, and they'll say and Facebook's been blowing up and causing me anxiety as I've pestered you guys about asking if you've been getting the inundation of friend requests like I have. You know, I haven't got any. I haven't even got one. No, I guess I don't you're more popular not... than me. Yeah, I'm, 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 I'm painfully woe on emails from perverts, so. <laughs> I, mean, I, get, I, get a, I, I, I get a lot of... Uh... 
Yeah, I get a lot of friend requests. Both of them are perverts. But speaking of perverts, I do want to give a shout out to my mother, who is probably listening <laughs> today. Um, oh, well, I don't want to say I'm she's mom. a pervert. I, I, I do want to say that there was a situation that I was in, I was in the hospital. And anyway, I got home, and she was there, and she asked me about um, something about being uh, single. I mentioned she's always single, and she needs to find herself a man, so I... Uh, I guess I put uh, an app that I shouldn't have put on her phone, and uh, yeah, it was it was, it, it was Grinder, and uh, when you uh, <laughs> put it on her phone, that's a joke, and you can just uh, and if those of you listening knows what Grinder is, um, I, the, I it's uh, anyway, but anyway, she by going by the name Short Stuff, it doesn't help. It's a that gay app. dating app. Yep, and my mom said she wanted a man and. I thought I'd play a little joke on her, so I put that on there, and I guess that was a uh, wrong thing to do. But anyway, they all, they all wanted the short stuff. They all wanted the short yeah, they, stuff. <laughs> they did. They did. But, hey, anyway, <laughs> that's a, that aside, much love to you, Mom, and glad you're listening. And but anyway, how was your week? Love you, Mom. Did Lucia fall asleep again? <laughs> nah, he's oh. there. No, I'm oh, here. Okay. Um, How it's was been your average week? Um, just, you know, working, taking care of things around the house here. Uh, I'm also uh, gearing up the final weekend of haunt season coming up uh, this Friday. Uh, we've been having some good crowds at the 7th, 7th Street Haunt. Uh, and a little Business has been a little down compared to this time last year, and uh, we found out that uh, we've done some checking through the region. It seems like attendance at a lot of the haunts are down for whatever reason. Uh, we can't really figure out if it's the weather or if it's maybe just you know the economy that's affecting things, but uh, you know, stuff like that. What about you, Brynn? How was your week? My week was uh my week was decent, man. You know, I uh, I got a lot done. I got my health insurance reinstated. I got my car all registered and everything, so it was good. I mean, I've been down for the past couple of days, bro. But honestly, that post that you made earlier, man, you just put a smile on my face, brother. You know, it just put things in perspective for me. Is just you know, we're all going through stuff, and we can all come through it together, man. You know, just gotta yep. fight hard. And, uh... Yeah, and, I, and I know you do, man. Together. You are a complete inspiration to me, Steve. Honestly, you really are. And I'm saying that from the bottom of my heart. I'm not just saying that because I'm on the radio show. You really are, man, honestly. I look forward to talking to you every day, dude. Honestly, I really do. I appreciate it. And do you want me to pay you 15 bucks now or later for saying that? <laughs> <laughs> I'll just take it now, man. You can write a check. <laughs> No, anyway, I'm serious. No, but, um, no, man. Keith is a Keith is an amazing man. To anybody who uh, is listening to the show and doesn't really know him personally, he is a great dude and uh, quite an inspiration to many people. And you know, just keep keep inspiring, man. Honestly. And now I'm gonna probably get another twenty perverted friend requests. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, no, today's gonna be a great show, though. And before we go off, I, I want to take off of what. We heard anyone saying that inspiration comes from everyone, and I want to give a big thank out to, let me see if I say his name correctly, Derek Lashaw over in England. He happened to show his um, his support for me, and he actually got a Don, a professional wrestling tattoo put on him. Now, those cool. I showed uh, I showed you guys, but... um. That that was back in my wrestling days. It's it's glad to be remembered still for those days. Um, it's a time I really really miss. Also, um, but to get back on track here, um, how many of you watched the movie? I'm getting one. I'm getting one. I'm getting the yeah, Donald the Dead Tat. Donald the Dead Tat. Yeah, we. I don't yeah. know if that, that that that'd be something unique seeing a Donald the Dead tattoo. I mean. That's Donald what I'm saying. Wrestling. I'm gonna get either. A, even if it's just your hat, you know what I mean? Because I'm filling my whole arm with horror pieces. I don't know if you guys have seen what I had so far, but I'm going to throw it in there somewhere for sure, bro. Lucian has a tattoo right above his left buttock, for those of you listening. <laughs> but, uh, <laughs> but anyway. I, um, I, I, I want to get oh. one for the back of my neck that says this end up. So. 
of Michelle's face. Uh, Michelle, you have tattoos. I know you have a lot have of them. Lots of tattoos. Oh yeah, she got plenty. I love those. Tattoos. I'm not saying I'm not saying I saw her body completely, but I'm just saying that I saw a lot of tattoos of what I did see. I like them. <laughs> well, thank you. I think I have 21, maybe 22. Ooh, I don't know. Oh damn! I forgot. I've kind of forgotten. I, I lost up. track. <laughs> Time's so getting a new one. I, I I need a new one after Christmas. Come with me to my guy. Fly down to Rhode Island. <laughs> yeah, we hop on my broomstick, you know. <laughs> Ooh. Brr. <laughs> but um, um, Michelle, you watched the Mutilator. You yes, saw I that did. This week, and you said you liked it. Um. For back in the day, we did fit in with the the cult classic uh, slasher films in that genre that came out in the eighties, yeah. and was it's one of my favorites. And Bud Cooper has been a is a huge inspiration to me through a lot, and um, it's gonna be great talking to him today on the on the year on the show. But um, uh, Brandon, have you watched The Mutilator yet? You know, I caught <laughs> um, I caught some pieces. I caught flicks of it. Uh, when I decided to watch it, I was actually going through some stuff. But I caught some of it, and what I did get from it was I got that really gritty 80s slasher style feel to it, which I did like a lot. Yeah, it was very gritty. It was a lot of blood. Um, back in and, the 80s, and, and, uh, and by the way, and the special effects and makeup were uh, amazing. Yeah, some really impressive stuff for back in the 80s. Mm-hmm. For sure. And I know Michelle was just biting at the bit that the mention her favorite scene or the the scene that caught off God was the gaff scene. That was the big fishing hook scene. Yeah, and I texted you immediately like, she took a fish hook to the vagina. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> it, it was oh, it that was scene wild. I did see. I don't know whether I was turned on or I don't know what happened. I was like, what, wait, wait, what? <laughs> no, I, it's incredible. I mean, f- fishing hooks to the vagina, you know, that can go either way. I mean, some girls will like it, some girls, you know. You never know what they're into. It was a giant well, fish hook to the vagina. When you watch this from, that's how, hey, 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 that's how I reel all my women in. <laughs> <laughs> Oh, <laughs> mom. <laughs> Something revoking poetic license, jeez. Lucy, when you first saw The Mutilator, because um, you're a horror fan, and I know you saw many, many horror fans. I said horror, not horror. For those of you listening, I have an accent. I'm still from Rhode Island. so. Um, but the thing is, is that... Hey, is I'm a horror fan. Ain't nothing wrong with horrors. <laughs> But no, uh, Lucy, when you watched The Mutilator, what was your impression back in the day when you watched it? Well, I mean, it. Uh, I, I would think, you know, if I saw it when it first came out, my opinion would have been a little different. But, uh, you know, it's, it's the setup, it's, it, it's kind of really interesting setup to it because these, you get these kids like in this a place that, will be isolated. I mean, because it's the fall, it's the beach, it's the condo. You know, they and they make it a point saying, well, gosh, there's not a regular police patrol around here. And, uh, and there's this one room that's literally just full of potential weapons right there. I say, hmm, what's going to happen okay. here? Uh, <laughs> somebody keeping count? Uh, <laughs> but, uh, and it's, okay. I mean, it's... Uh, you know, it it's, uh, it's almost really sets up some of the, what's kind of got to be almost some of the standard conventions that you, uh, you know, find in horror films these days. You know, here are the victims. You know, here's where this is going to take place and so on and so on and so on. And uh, I'm, I'm, amazed, I'm like, Brandon, I'm really impressed, though, in that for a low-budget film, some of the makeup effects that they executed were like, wow, like, you know, that's really something. And I like yeah, when definitely. I first saw like, it, oh, like, it, it, it was almost if like you forgot that it's the eighties that they're doing these things. You know what I mean? Like, especially with the blood and gore, like it looks so realistic, like hyper realistic, almost like as if you were watching a snuff film. 
which uh, there's a few films that actually <laughs> the uh, the police ended up getting involved. One of them, I think, being the Green Inferno back in the day, yeah. where it looks so realistic that uh, the they thought that there were real murders, and it kind of reminded me of that, just of how hyper realistic well, all the special was, effects really it were. The Cannibal Holocaust was the one. Yeah, that really that's what it was. Cannibal that. Holocaust. Yeah. Yeah. But, Green, um, Green and, Inferno was a sequel to that. It wasn't a series, it was more like a, a spin off to go back into the cannibal type genre. But um, Ed yeah, Farrell was, did all the makeup yeah, effects the on the mutilator. Yeah, Ed Farrell did all the makeup effects on the mutilator, and he did an awesome job. And I was just watching it at the time. But the cast also, I mean, you had Matt Mittler, you had Ruth Martinez, you had Bill Hitchcock, Connie Rogers, Francis Zane. You had a lot of great actors. Ben Moore was in it. I mean, you had a lot of good actors in that film and a lot of those actors went off into other directions in the film and, and they succeeded. Um, but Bud Cooper really did a good job and um, he put this together. And I, if you ever watched the mutilator on the arrow Blu-ray, they have a feature it's a full length feature and it explains about the making of the film and, and all that went through making of the film. And, and it's amazing. And I give a shout out to Adol put, for putting that together. They did a great job putting the Blu-ray together for the Mutilator. But I'm looking forward to talking to um, Bud Cooper, who will be joining us really soon. But also later on tonight, we have Nathan Bayes that will be joining us. And Nathan has been, I mean, I can't say enough good things about Nathan. I mean, he he's a great guy. He did so much in film and television production work and so forth and uh he's just a, a wonderful guy and nathan was well known as being leslie vernon in behind the mask and behind the mask like we talked about it many times in our past episodes it was uh, a great film i mean you had uh the um robert england who was in that film you had m- many great actors in that film um and but um his character um, Nathan's character just, I mean, it's something that if they spawn sequels, which I understand they have comic books and such, but um, if they they have the film, a, a sequel, a prequel, I mean, Nathan can bring life into that character like he did in, the, for, in this film, and it was it was just awesome. The film also had the final film appearance of Zelda Rubenstein, who, if you don't know the yes. name, he was the psychic Poltergeist. in the original the original Poltergeist, yeah. Yep. And uh, I'm looking forward to to both of these guests today. And it's going to be a great Halloween special. Um, and anyway, um, so speaking of Halloween, you guys got your costumes already? You guys doing trick-or-treating or anything fun for the Halloween? Yeah, I'm going to dress up as a big corn stalk because I'm so corny. So that's the plan. <laughs> but um boom Literally, that should be in. You think I'm playing? I already got the costume and everything. I'm dressed up as a big corn stalk. Everybody always calls yeah. me a corn, so I figure it fits me well. Well, it, it does fit you well, but I mean, I just <laughs> fuck you. I, I just can't. I cannot picture Brandon. I can't picture you walking around as a gigantic corn stalk. I mean, it's just something. <laughs> That, that just well, it's going to happen. Mind. It's going to happen. It'll be documented. I'll take pictures. <laughs> and I yep. think he will, too. Yeah, just don't walk around with a corn cob stuck up your ass. I mean, <laughs> something we don't want to say. I just might. And Maybe what about, I will. Maybe I will. What about you, What about you, Michelle? What are you going to be as for Halloween? Ooh, I want to hear this. I have actually no idea. <laughs> I kind of... Michelle, why, why, why don't you be a vampire? Well, because I'm always a vampire anyway. So and it's nice to there's be no problem with that. It's nice to be something different sometimes. But, yeah, usually I kind of wing it, and I'll just start putting stuff together and see what happens. So I, I just I have, like, a million wigs and different things, so I have no idea, actually. I don't know what Michelle, can you be happens. can you be a corn stalk with me? <laughs> yeah, I could. I could, I could stop and pick up yes. the corn stalk and tape them to me. Be a <laughs> corn stalk. It'll be hilarious. Ruby corn yep. stock. Yes. So down. Um, well, we're going to be playing, I'm going to play here a quick trailer to the Mutilator, and then we're going to be joined by Bud Cooper, who is yeah. the writer and director of this great film. 
Oh, Terry. What do you say? Four days of R and R at the beach. I'm in. She's in. I'm in. I got a bad feeling about this. They thought their vacation would be fun. They were wrong. Dead wrong. He's what's called a trophy hunter. Boom, 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 boom. Dad used to tell me that he'd hunted everything but man. a trailer to The Mutilator, which we are now joined by Bud Cooper, the writer and director of this great cult classic horror film. Mm-hmm. How you doing, Bud? Uh, I'm doing What's well. What's up, Bud? Good What's up? Welcome. Hey, How you been, brother? How's your night going? It's going well so far. I hope it continues. How many people we got tuned in? You got to know? Well, we have uh, quite a few listeners, but we are joined also by uh, my co-hosts. You have Michelle Yeager, and Hello. you have Brand, you have Brandon Levesque, Hello, and you, How you doing tonight, and you bud? have Luce, and you have Luce Tombs. Hello, Luce. Okay. So, but first, I want to thank you for taking the time off to, to join our show today to talk about this great film, which you know I I always tell you how much this film is to me. I mean, I always, I always watch it. I'm a big fan of it. But, um, yeah. again, thank you for yeah. joining us. It's been my pleasure. Now, the, the Mutilator, like, what brought you to, to want to make this film? Like, when did you get drawn into the field of filmmaking and say, this is it, um, when you got to that point, this is the film I'm going to make, and this is what I'm going to go for? Well, uh, gosh, I, uh, I always wanted to make movies, and uh, this particular movie came to mind uh, on Tuesday after Labor Day, about 83, I guess. We live in Atlantic Beach, which is a tourist town. It's a seasonal tourist town, and in the summer, it's just packed here. At that time, our year, our winter population was about 400, but in the summer, it would mushroom to about 40,000. And Labor Day weekend is one of the big weekends of the year. Uh, and it was just elbow to elbow people. And I don't, I'm not complaining. I'm glad that they were here. Everybody here makes a living from tourism. But the, the contrast between Labor Day and the following day, Tuesday, is stark. On Labor Day, you can't find a place on the beach to, to spread a beach towel. And then on the following day, Tuesday, it's desolate. So on this Tuesday after Labor Day, I was walking on the beach with a friend of mine, and it, we, we could, there was nobody. You could look both ways for miles and not see anybody. And it occurred to me that we were living on an island connected to the mainland by one drawbridge, and that if the drawbridge went out, we'd be isolated. And it occurred to me that that would be a a pretty good setting to bring a bunch of college kids and kill them off one at a time. Since we were, <laughs> since we were uh, on an island. I love it. Beach. I love it. I love it. What a good yeah. idea. Uh, uh, it, uh, it, since we were at the beach, 
it just seemed natural to have the uh, maniac kill these children with nautical implements. Uh, so that's that's how it started, and after that happened, it sort of wrote itself, as they say. And uh, well, the result was a mutilator, which we all love. Yeah, it was a great movie. Um, <clears throat> what? Where is your hometown? I'm com- I'm I'm actually uh kind of curious, just off your accent. Right here, right here, Atlantic Beach, North Carolina, like which where we wow. shot it. You like it down there? Say it again. Said, so do you like it down there? Oh yeah, it's uh, I've I've been around a lot of places and I've lived in a few places and this is the best place. Uh, it's people love it here and and it's I'm I'm yeah yeah I'm fortunate to have been born and raised here. You know I got here. That's awesome, everybody. man. It's awesome. Now, Bud, when you were like when you got the everything together, you're making the film and that. Was how hard was it to get everyone behind your vision of making this motion picture? Um, because I, I remember watching on the feature app on Yavo Blu ray, which it did an awesome job on. I remember you saying there was a clip you were saying how you had a choice to make a motion picture, or was it to go into like a real estate or property or something, but you chose to make this motion picture? Like, um, was everyone behind you on that decision? The uh, uh the answer is yes, but the the decision was whether to go to film school or make a movie. I was practicing law at the time, and I read an in-depth article in the New York Times about film schools, and it rated two or three of the uh, superior film schools and what was good about them. And at the very end, it it uh, ended. the article ended by saying, however, if you have a choice of going to film school or getting a job on a movie, take the job. You'll learn more on one motion picture production than you will in four years of film school. And so I thought, well, if I can take the same money that I would spend in film school and make a movie. Well, that, that was, uh, uh, that was wishful thinking, but that was the idea that that was what, that was a decision that I made to, to make a movie instead of going to film school. Now to answer your question, was it hard to get everyone behind the vision? No. Um, we, was it uh, was with, it the right decision? It was the right decision for me. Yeah, is that what you asked me? Yeah, I'm having a little uh, hearing aid problems here. So if I if I ask you if I don't catch something, I'll ask you if I heard it right. Yeah, we had, everybody was on board. Uh, we the, the first person I think we uh, hired was Peter Schnall, who was a DP. Interviewed several DPs and Peter. No, it was just the best. He just stood out from all the rest. And he came and brought with him a union crew, uh, mostly the department heads. John Douglas, who helped a lot with the screenplay and is a professor of film at the American University of Washington, D.C., came and brought with him a lot of uh, film students, recently graduated film students and uh, film graduate students. And most of those people were young single women, and most of the department heads, which Peter Schnallbrook that brought down, were uh, single young men. So there was a lot of gleefulness <laughs> on the set. Everybody was happy. People were dating. A couple of marriages resulted, as a matter of fact, from this thing. Absolutely. So the people, the people were all good. It was a really good atmosphere. Uh, the cast got got into it right away. They all uh, really uh, became the characters. Jack Chatham is Big Ed turned out to be one mean son of a bitch, and that's exactly what it's supposed to be. Uh, Bill Hitchcock brought the uh, Joker Ralph to life. Matt personified Little Ed and his non-belief of what was going on. And Ruthie made the perfect sweet little girl. Connie, the mid-range girl, and Francis, the hot one. So everybody, you know, it just it required no effort to get everyone on board to make this movie. They got, They all got it right at the beginning, and they made it happen. Wow, great! Yeah. And watching the film, I mean, the the cast did did do a great job. I mean, I was just really, I mean, I watch it numerous times. And Matt, like I said, Matt was just awesome. As Matt had a lot of Bill, Bill, 
Yeah, and Bill Hitchcock brought a lot of humor to the film. I mean, he was just uh, right on cue with a lot of his lines and such when it comes to the humor part. Um, mm-hmm. And but the thing is, when it when it came to uh, the, the Big Ed, I mean, you the, when it came to the killer himself, I mean, that was just one great villain you put together there. But uh, the special <laughs> effects, Ed. Ed did an awesome job on the special effects. We were just talking about that, that before you came on. Ed Farrow did an awesome job on the special effects with this film. Well, I'm going to tell you that uh, Ed happens to be sitting right next to me here. He came up to, to lend his ears in case I misunderstood anything. So so if you have a question you want to direct to Ed, he's right here. You can ask him. Oh, wow. Ed, I you want to tell you personally... I want to tell you personally, Ed, we really admired your work you did with the special effects on the mutilator. Back yeah, in that the, time uh, period, in that day, you did a great job. Phenomenal. Phenomenal. Yeah, these are great. Can you hear me? Oh, yeah, yep. I can hear you. Yeah, look, these are wonderful compliments. I'll take my share. But you need, <laughs> to, you need to mention Mark Schostrom. Uh, Mark led the team. Um, are you familiar with his work? Familiar with some of his work, um, like from the Night- Nightmare on Elm Street and Evil Dead 2 and yeah. such. Yeah. It, yeah. What were some of the movies he worked on? Well, now, this was the big, the first big one, really. But he... Uh, what, what he was trying to say is I gave him a start. You understand? <laughs> <laughs> He's such a talent, and uh, I learned from everything I know from him. But Mark went on to do, I'm telling you, he was, I want to say, Phantasm 2. Um, he ended up doing, uh, working on Star Trek. Hold this. Oh, sorry. Star Trek with Neelix. Oh, I'm going to miss so many. But um, he and I worked later on a film called uh, Ghost Soldier. And that's the last time I saw him, uh, I worked with him, was in Los Angeles. But Mark Schostrom uh, was really the head of that department. And um, and so uh, I just don't want to take the credit where I don't deserve it. I was there, believe me, part of it. But let's mm-hmm. give uh, a kudos out to Mark. Yeah, and Mark also did great work on one of my favorite films. It's underrated film is Deep Star Six with the creature effects. He did a great right. job on that film as well. Yeah, but, yeah. He has, this, this is such a talent. And um, oh, we want to get him. Aren't you going to make another one? Aren't you going to get? Uh, I want to get Buddy back over here. We want him to make another movie. <laughs> Look, thanks but, for those um, compliments, though, guys. You're welcome. And also a shout out to Mark Showstrom. Um, like mm-hmm. I said, he did a great job also on special effects. Of course, of course. Now, yeah, uh, man, those uh, special uh, effects were uh, uh, very ahead of time for the age that the movie was made, for sure. Now, Bud, when when you filmed the Mutilator, was there any obstacles that arose, or was there any, or did it, or did it run smoothly at the time from from beginning to end? <laughs> I know, I know, there was the. Uh, wasn't it the um, the pool scene that was the one that was the most hectic to, to get done? Well, 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 that one was uh, the most time sensitive one. That, that there was it was a gag that didn't work. That was one of them. Uh, we were shooting at night that night, and we were shooting at night most nights, in fact, and we were trying to get everything done before the sun came up. And we were we were prepped and waiting for the special effects crew to come and give us the gag for Linda's death in the pool. As written, she's floating on her back in the pool. A spear gun spear shoots through her, bursts through her chest. And she's stunned when she sees it. The blood is spurting out. And the spear, the spear is then yanked back. It's got a couple of prongs that open up and press under her flesh, and she's dragged under by this spear. Uh, Big Ed is under, under the water, and they shot over the spear gun. So we're sitting on the porch of the condo, looking at our watches, checking the sky, waiting for the special effects team. And Ed and Mark walk up, and Ed said, uh, buddy, we got a problem. I said, <laughs> I said what's the problem? And uh, 
And we've got Hope, cast and crew standing around. Now everybody's on the clock. And Mark said, we can't make it work. I said, what do you mean we can't make it work? And they said, we just can't make it work. <laughs> it's not going to happen. I said, oh, fuck it. I said, well, look, we'll just drown her. We had to go. We had to have a dead woman right then. And so that's what we did. We went to the pool and uh, – and drowned her, as you as you see, and it, it turned out fairly well, to tell you the truth. I still miss that spear scene, though. The uh, another I'm thing doing, that went wrong. The movie. <laughs> <laughs> another thing that went wrong was uh, the end, in the end, Big Ed was supposed to be chopped in half by the drawbridge, uh, and at the last minute, the state of North Carolina decided that they didn't want us want, didn't want to let us use the drawbridge. It wasn't. The picture wasn't suitable, so we had to we had to come up with the ending that, wow. that that's in the picture now, and uh, we, we and I you know I'm not so sure that this is better than the drawbridge. I will point out though that uh, even though the state didn't want to support us and did not support us, that every time after that that they listed the feature movies that had been made in North Carolina, they always mentioned the Little Mutilator. So take this <laughs> out. Yeah, the oh, the drawbridge would have been something interesting to see. That's for sure. Yeah, I, I would have liked to see that. And um, yeah, also, you know, Lucian is a big fan of the Mutilator as well. <laughs> oh, oh, yeah. Well, you know, I might have a script around here somewhere. I'll Xerox the page and send it to you. I'll scan it and email it. <laughs> you can read about it. Now, when the film was like in the 80s, I remember going into the, the, the video stores. I mean, I was raised in a video store, and I saw that um, box art. I mean, it was beautifully done. It, it was just something you, you watch as a horror fan. You're like, I got to see this film. And uh, you sent me a couple of posters. I have them hanging up, framed in that. Um, but it's one of my favorite box arts. Did, um, when, you, right. when you made that film back in the 80s, and uh, how was it, after the film wrapped, how was it knowing that film was going to be on the big screen, and did it take off fast? Like, was there a lot of uh, publicity behind it, and did it really go forward as you planned? Yeah, that was the plan. It uh, it really felt good, Keith, uh, having it in the can, wrapped. Uh, that, was, uh, that was a really good feeling. It was a... a Feeling of accomplishment, and I, I think everybody on the set, cast and crew and support, and everywhere had the same feeling. Everybody, everybody was glad and felt like something had been accomplished that the thing was done, and that was just the beginning. Ed took the took the dailies to Washington D.C. and trimmed them, and then I picked him up and we went on to New York City to the film center where we had rented an editing room, and spent I guess four months. Uh, in post-production, something that wouldn't happen now, but that's the way it was then. And we got started late. We didn't know what, I didn't know what we were, I didn't know what I was doing. Uh, uh, Probably it would have been better to begin post-production just on the second or third day of shooting, have somebody right there editing the thing. But I didn't know that's the way it was supposed to be. Uh, So finally, when the thing was finished, we, uh, we held a premiere in Moorhead City, across the bridge from Atlantic Beach, and it was a, it was a kind of a big deal for Little Moorhead City, and we played it up. We had fun with it. Uh, it was just a, well, it, it's the picture, you know. It's not a blockbuster, but we pretended that it was. We had spotlights up in the sky, limousines, tuxedos, photographers, newspaper and radio reporters were there, and. Uh, my sister sent me a nice bouquet of dead roses to congratulate me. <laughs> and uh, the, uh, the theater, which held about 600 people, was packed uh, all by invitation. That, that, that premiere screen, everybody loved it. Uh, I, I, can, uh, I can still hear the applause at the end. And then, then, then we started uh, charging admission after that, and it did well for about six weeks. It was making a ton of money. It finally got awesome. an official... An official uh, release coincidentally on Labor Day weekend um, in 85, 84, I don't remember, in New York City where it did well in the Northeast, made it, it uh, showed uh, showed up at 
number 13 on Weekly Variety's chart of top grossing movies. Stayed on the wow. chart for six weeks. It uh, it played L.A. and San Francisco, and all of those bookings were the unrated version. But when we got out of those pockets of intellectualism, uh, we couldn't get bookings. Had trouble getting bookings. When we got bookings, we couldn't hold the bookings because the uh, picture was unrated, which at that time was tantamount to an X rating, and an X rating meant sexual pornography. So the newspapers and the TV stations and the radio stations wouldn't carry the ads because it was unrated. So we could, you know, it was just, it, we couldn't we couldn't show it, and so I was forced to go back to the MPAA and cut it to get an R rating, uh, and they made us cut out all the gore. It was it was a movie made for gore fans, and so when you cut out the gore, it was no longer interesting and uh, and was not successful at the box office as a result. So I don't know like, if I answered um, the question like or not. Oh yes, that that was, but that, I can see how like the the ratings ain't that kind of complicated. Like the ratings board, they're always complicated yeah. when it comes to uh, filmmaking and that. When it comes to the the gore and heavy gore and sexuality and everything, they always put that restriction on there. And back in the '80s, it was probably kind of tougher than it is now to do films like that. Oh yeah, definitely. Oh yeah, yeah, and it was while we were in post, people were telling me, I know the guys from Fangoria Magazine and like that came by and said, look, you need to hurry this thing up. The world mood is changing against gore pictures. And I took it to Paris. I forgot the name of it, but there's an annual horror festival in Paris where uh, it gets wild. You can throw firecrackers on the stage and that sort of thing. I took it there and uh, I, was, I went up in the balcony to watch some other pictures, and uh, there were some actors up there who was booing me. Well, they do the gore. Why do you do the gore? Well, you know, that's what it is. Mm-hmm. Came in, uh, came in number fifteen out of a few dozen pictures at that festival. Incidentally, I was proud of that. And, and back in that time period, we had like movies like uh, The Mutilator was uh, was one of the, the gore flicks that were there. Um, that was a great film, and then so you blended right in now. Um, I also, I remember seeing pictures of 42nd Street and the Mutilator was one of those top billings that were always on those marquees, the Mutilator, Mutilator. Um, that was something that is just very rememberable. Um, but it goes back to how I, I feel that the, the how the genre changed. Back then it was more rated R film, rated R films when it comes to horror. And uh, now it's toned down to like the PG-13 ever. But um, when it came down to talks of you bringing the mutilator back out on the market on Blu-ray for a whole new generation of fans and all those people that embraced the film, the embraced the classic over the years. How did it feel to, to have that come to your plate and say, we want to do this for you? Arrow did that, the Arrow films, and we want to put this together for you. How did that feel to, to know that this film was going to come out, come out to a Blu-ray release to all these new generations of fans? Um. Well, before I answer that, let me say that we, we went up to New York and saw it on 42nd Street also, and that was a real treat. It must have been uh, it was a, one of the big old houses, a thousand seats or more in there, and uh, people screaming and crying and yelling at the characters on the screen, don't do that, don't do that. And uh, that was a real hoot. Uh, Jack Chatham was with us on one of those trips, and some people sitting in the row in front of him, he said something, they turned around and looked. And they saw Big Ed sitting right behind them in the theater. They screamed and got up and ran out of the theater. So it was well received uh, on 42nd Street. We loved it. That's awesome. Yeah, popcorn well, everywhere. Say it again. I said popcorn yeah. everywhere. Popcorn everywhere. Yeah, popcorn everywhere. <laughs> the, uh, you know, people have been asking for years. Uh, when is the mutilator going to come out on DVD. And it was tied up some here for, for some reasons I don't want to go into. But ultimately, uh, let's see, um, what's the what's the uh, video distributor shot something? Chow Factory. Um, Chow Factory yeah. was talking to me. And then uh, Arrow Video started talking to me. And, and Chow Factory sort of faded away. And Arrow Video impressed me with uh, was this guy, Ewan Kent, 
impressed me with his sincerity. He was a fan of the movie. He wanted to do it. And we sort of hit it off right away and just agreed on a deal over the telephone just in a few minutes. And he came from London to Atlantic Beach to conduct personally some of the interviews and to supervise some of the background stuff that was produced. We uh, we went through all of our old uh, prints trying to find the best one. And I had a, a print that had not been cut, but I couldn't find it. Someone broke into my storage and stole some stuff, and I suspect they stole that. But we were wrestling with re- reconstituting an unrated version from these old prints and from the from the uh, parts that had been cut out, which I saved. And it occurred to me, I remembered that we had deposited a print for copyright purposes with the uh, Library of Congress. Ewan knew somebody who knew somebody and got through to the Library of Congress and borrowed the deposit print from the Library of Congress, which was a pristine print, been shown one time, and was uncut. Which, which formed the basis of the Blu-ray. The timing was off, and they had to spend some time uh, color correcting and adjusting the timing. I went up to uh, Bridgeport and, and went over that with a couple of technicians. But they put a lot of time and effort in the making of the Blu-ray, and I love it. I think it turned out extremely well. The uh, if you ha- If there's anybody who hasn't seen the whole package, there are, in addition to the Blu-ray there, there, uh, there's a, a lot of background, behind the scenes stuff, shots. Uh, there's a making of video with interviews and cast and crew. It's all just superbly well done. And if you don't, if you haven't seen it, I, I recommend that you find a friend who's got it and and watch some of it. It was just really good. So it, to answer your question, it made me feel really good to see it come out uh, on a DVD. And satisfied something I've been wanting for a while, and I know that some other people have wanted it also. And I have my my copy of the Blu-ray sitting proudly on my shelf with my VHS copy of the Mutilator and uh, All right. one of my prize collections. But I'm then, glad to um, hear. And, uh, but Avo, I do, I do give a shout out to them. They did an excellent job of putting it together. They even have the music, Fall Break, which is, yeah. if you listen to it, if you listen to that song, uh, as corny as it is, that song just stays in your head. It's just one of those it songs does. that just stay in your head and you can't help it. it, does, it does. Now, I, we're going on a fall break. That was uh, Michael Menard did music for that and a friend of his, Artie, I can't remember Artie's last name right now. Huh? Resnick. Artie Resnick, maybe, yeah, who uh, wrote the lyrics for Under the Boardwalk, one of the Drifter big hits back in the 70s, I guess. And we went to Nyack to record it, and I was present, and I was going to be the one singing, we're going on that. <laughs> but just before we were ready to record, uh, this big, big dude walked in, and uh, Menard knew him, and he said, how about do this bass line for us? And the, and the guy, did he did a better job than I could have done, but I was there. Now, I'm listed on the record as one of the breakers, and that was the uh, name that Menard came up with for those of us who made the record, recorded it. And my part in the tune now is this. I went from, we're going on a, to this. And then the guy still I, was one of the people, I was one of the people snapping fingers. <laughs> it was, but, you know, listen, that show is, that song, right? Though. Yep, and that song just catches you right when you listen to it. It just stays in your head. Yeah. But um, now I know you talked about this in the in the past, um, but do you feel that one day we might see a sequel to the Mutilator? Uh, I was hoping you would ask that question. We have talked about a sequel to the Mutilator for thirty years. Um, I wrote a. a another screenplay last year, but nobody liked it but me. So uh, so we didn't make that one. I have been saving my money for years, and uh, I think I've got enough to bankroll another small picture. I've started writing a screenplay about 10 days ago. It's going very sluggishly, but I'm slucking away at it. And I've been advertising for a couple of years for a screenplay. Uh, and I've read a bunch of them. I've read a lot of in- of query letters and a lot of synopses. I haven't found just the right one yet. Uh, 
uh, we were ready to go. All we needed was the right screenplay. And if any of you were listeners would care, have a, a finished screenplay, which they would like to talk about, I'd be happy to entertain a, a query letter from them. Uh, I, 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 what I would like would be uh, two or three sentence synopsis of the story, whatever it might be. Uh, uh, little girl's aunt and uncle turn into werewolves at her birthday party and eat the guests, or you know, whatever it is. Uh, and a, a brief letter with a short synopsis, and this is critical. Also. A standard release form. I don't supply those, but they're on the internet. Just Google screenplay release form and you'll get a half a dozen right away. And if anybody wants to submit such a, a, a query letter, they can send it to script at bud cooper.com. I'll say it again script, S C R I P T, at bud cooper.com. Finished screenplays only, no ideas, no music videos, no TV pilots, just finished screenplays. And uh, if you're interested, let me know. We're ready to go. Just all we need is a screenplay. Yeah, to answer your question, we intend to make a sequel. And I I know when I watch the film, I always pick on those little things and, and say, this this could be good for a sequel, this could be good for a sequel. I know you, one of your pinnacles was the mask. You always wanted to base something around that mask. Um, in the mutilator, um, I, I always thought that maybe what if uh, Matt's character grew up and he was kept on having these flashbacks? So he was in a hospital and so forth, and his uh, he got out when they thought they would visit the old set, the old place, and everything starts happening again little by little, and you just don't know who the killer is and that type of field. I mean, there's a lot of things you can go with angles to really pick up your original film and carry on with it. Yeah, yeah. Ed's over here nodding his head. How about write some of that down and shoot it to him? (laughs) (laughs) But um, now, do you um, now the with the mutilator? Like, do you if you go back in time? Is there anything you would interrupt? I'm sorry. What was? Let me interrupt the uh, before you get away from it. The screenplay which I wrote, which nobody liked, was based on that mask. So we're thinking along the same lines. Please go ahead. But yeah, no. But that that mask. I mean, you could do something with it. I mean, it could have some kind of uh, uh, force behind it. Or there's a he got it from a certain Ed's father got it from a certain area and brought it back home and could have did something. It could be something based upon that mask. You can go with. I mean, it's just that I see a lot of potential with a sequel to the Mutilator, and believe me, my mind spinning when it. I mean, I talked to you in the past about it as well. But um, like if you could change anything yeah. about the Mutilator. I'm sorry, what was that? What would I change about it? If, Are you yeah, is there anything you can... Is, is, there, is, there, is there anything you can... If you go back in time, is there anything you can change about the mutilator? If you wanted to change anything at all. I mean, it was perfect the way it was. But if you can change something, is there something you wanted to change? Uh, that's a good question. Um, I might change the casting of one or two roles. I think I changed a few lines of dialogue, maybe more than a few lines of dialogue. The cast did marvelously with what was written, but now I think I could have helped them out a little bit more with better dialogue. I tried to spend less money. We spent a long time in post-production, and uh, you know, I started out thinking I had eighty-four thousand dollars. I thought I could make a movie for eighty-four thousand, and wound up spending four hundred and fifty thousand uh, to get it in the can plus more on top of that for prints and advertising. But uh, we spent a long time in post-production, and that's something that would go much more quickly now, shooting digital. I would I would shoot digital. Um, and I think that's it. You know, for somebody who didn't know anything about making a movie to, to, to you know, come up with a music, I think it turned out well. Uh, I'm proud of it, but I'll be the first to admit that I had an awful lot of help from the cast and crew and I'll be eternally grateful to them all, except that he had over here. Hey, we're ready to do the spear scene now. <laughs> okay. <laughs> well, you better be sure the sun will be up in a few more hours. 
Now, um, you still keep in t- contact with a lot of the, the cast and the crew from the original Mutilator. Um, and that would be another great thing to do if you made a sequel, bring back the original cast that were left. I mean, Ed killed a lot of people. <laughs> There's very few left. But, um, but anyway, you still keep in contact with a lot of them, and a lot of them went on to do bigger things and great things with their career, like we talked about earlier. Um, but also to put it out there, um, to all your listeners, Bud Cooper is the man that also helped me through my screenwriting um, time when I was writing screenwriting. Ed, uh, Bud Cooper was always there for me to help me out with that. Always helped me out with with everything, with filming, gave me advice. I mean, I owe a lot to him. Um, now, is there anything you want to promote and any upcoming appearances that we can look forward to in the future, conventions or anything, Bud? Um, Keith, uh, Ed and I, and sometimes Jack Chatham and Ruth Tutteroo, Ruthie Martinez Tutteroo, uh, attend, we've been attending one or two horror festivals a year. Um, Ed and I, for instance, went to Syracuse earlier this year. Last year we went to Mad Monster Party in Charlotte. It's close enough to, uh, Ruth and Jack live in Greensboro, but it was close enough to Charlotte. They just drove over. A few weeks ago, we were in Durham at a week-long uh, horror film festival at the Carolina Theater, and uh, Ruth and Jack came over for that. And it's just we just have a really good time. Uh, we pose for pictures, sign autographs, sign posters. People like it, and so do we. However, we have nothing scheduled at this time. But we are available if anybody's got something and they're interested. We're always interested. Right, and, but it was it was great to have you on the show. And like I say, uh, I'm definitely going to send you a little three sentence thing on uh, a sequel. So tell Ed I'm going to be sending something to you guys. But um, okay. it's just you you did a great job on this film. You are a great person. And thank you for everything. And, I mean, like I said, The Mutilator is one of the great cult classics that you can see today. And, um, once again, you want to give that website out or that um, address to send out any script information? Yeah, yeah, thank you. Uh, Script at bud-cooper.com. Two or three sentence synopsis and a screenplay release. Keith, as always, it's been a pleasure talking to you. I wish you and the others the best. I'll get out of the way now so Nathan Basil can take over. Say hello from me. Yes. Take care, y'all. Talk to you later. You too, bud. And tell Ed I said bye, and you guys have a great evening, and thanks for joining us on Doc Society Entertainment Talk Live. Thank you, bud. Okay, Ed. Ed's waving goodbye. Thank you. See y'all later. Bye-bye. Bye. Bye, Bye, Cook. See ya. <laughs> See ya. Well, that was uh, that was Bud Cooper that joined us. Um, great talk with him about the mutilator. But now we're going to be um, joined by one of uh, a person I really was looking forward to talking to as well. Um, I'm a huge fan of his work, and that would be Nathan Basil. How you doing, Nathan? All right, I'm good. Can you hear me? Well, I yes, can hear you perfectly. great. Um, Bud Cooper okay. was on the air with us a few minutes ago. He said to tell you he said hi, and he loves your work as well. Uh, he sounds like a real class act. I didn't hear all the story. Do you know if he's from Texas? Because he reminded me of my grandfather a whole lot. He's from South Carolina right now. South Carolina. Oh. Oh. Yeah. So, Nathan, um, um, first off, thank you for joining us. Um and, I mean, you have a illustrious career. You did so much in film, I mean, television. Um, notice uh, you did a great job on one of my favorite films, as Behind the Mask. A huge fan of yours, as everybody here. You're, um, also in the room is uh, co-host uh, Michelle Yeager and Lucian Toombs, who are also a huge fan of yours as well. Oh, and, um, Hi there. <laughs> Hi. Hi. Hi, everybody. So, um now, on your career, like, how did what brought you to filmmaking? Um, not filmmaking, but acting. You also probably did some filmmaking as well. But I mean, what brought you to the film world? Um, 
you know, I just did acting as a kid and then I started taking it more and more serious as the years went on. And, and when it got to the age where I was trying to figure out what I wanted to do with my life, I started doing more and more acting classes. And uh, the more I took, the more it felt like I had to learn and was excited to learn. So um, I just kept that route. And so I, I, I got my training in acting and and uh, when I was finally finished with college, I had 10 years of college. I figured it was about time for me to step away and, and do some real work. Um, and um, naturally, I just came came back. I grew up in Southern California, so I just went to L.A. And you were in a lot of um, different films, I mean, from the district and Cold Case. You did some of the TV series and that, and then... Your, your biggest television series you did a lot of back in the day was Invasion. I mean, did a, lot, a couple of yeah. episodes of there, and uh, that was a great show. Um, but then came yeah, Behind the Mask. The first long-term gig I ever got was, was Invasion, which was – that was pretty sweet. And then, uh, yeah, Behind the Mask came shortly. Actually, no, uh, I think I filmed Behind the Mask first, then did Invasion, and then – just as Invasion was wrapping up, uh, uh, Behind the Mask came out uh, on the in its theatrical release. It was and, such, uh, such a unique film in that, uh, I mean, it really sort of went against the grain because instead of it being like the usual horror fantasy where, you know, these characters, you know, were unreal or fictional, you know, it you played it straight. And I mean, oh, it, yeah. uh, I mean, you know, you were you were you were the young rookie, you know, setting out to make his mark in the major league, the serial killer. <laughs> mm-hmm. And yeah. uh, At, the more we spent making the movie, the more I realized how many parallels there were between uh, Leslie's career and mine. Both of us feeling like, uh, you know, we were we were journeymen, you know, working really hard, training really hard. Uh, just waiting for our big break, and uh, with in my in my case, I was crossing my fingers that the film was going to be it. And in Leslie's case, he was crossing his fingers that uh, that the massacre at the farmhouse was going to be his big break. Did you did you, did you do the cardio like Leslie did? <laughs> <laughs> I've always enjoyed uh, physicality and and you just rarely get an opportunity to work that physically in any of the film or TV. Um, and when there is highly physical stuff to do, uh, there's a stunt person hired on uh, to do it. But I, I just did a, a panel a couple weeks ago with P Wilbur, who, who played uh, Mike Myers in a few of the Halloween films. And um, the guy's a majority of his work is in stunt work. And, um, and, it was something to listen to his career because in a lot of ways, that's, a, that's the kind of, uh, that's, the, that's the kind of path I wanted to take. I wanted to, uh, I wanted to do stuff that was going to engage me really intensely. Um, Behind the mask was one of those rare projects that, that come across that allow you to do both acting with words and acting with your body. And you also worked with a lot of great co-hosts as well. I mean, you worked with um, Robert England, and also the uh, you worked with um, that the beautiful. I mean, she was a great actress, Zelda Rubenstein. That was one of her last mm-hmm. roles. Um, how was it like working oh, yeah. with all these uh, these great people with Angel- Angela and Robert and Scott Wilson and such? It could have been a disaster because uh, in all of those cases of everybody you just mentioned, they'd earn the right to to phone it in um, and and just cash catch cash a paycheck. And uh, none of them did. They came on entirely engaged and ready to play ball. Not just ready, but uh, but willing. Um, I think that the script was a big part of that it it was a fantastic calling card for the whole project because very few scripts will you read that have that kind of 
interesting premise and that solid an execution of the idea. Um, it just, it was clean, you know, there was no fat to trim. It was, it was, uh, just a fantastic script and it went a long way towards, um, you know, engendering a lot of support from, from people that we frankly needed. Um, you know, I was thinking the other day about, uh, Star Wars episode four, you know, the, the, the first Star Wars movie in 77, uh, it just, it must've looked crazy. I mean, it must've looked just nuts. And I'm sure there was so many instances where Alec Guinness, this, <laughs> this classically trained, esteemed, uh, around the world, British actor uh, must've been sitting there as Obi-Wan Kenobi, you know, in, in the most likely cantina or gosh, any number of situations thinking what, the hell have I gotten myself into? Well, you know, same could have been said for, for any of those guys. They didn't, um, Alec Guinness didn't need star Wars, but star Wars needed him. Um, and, uh, and Robert England didn't need Scott Wilson. Didn't need Zelda didn't need behind the mask, but behind the mask needed them. Um, so much of our credibility, uh, was owed to them just coming on board. Robert England always seems like he's having fun, regardless of what he's doing. Yeah, he does, doesn't he? <laughs> he's a funny guy. <laughs> I love him. Uh, and I, I've been fortunate enough to uh, have been able to spend some time with him, both both doing the film and, and doing promotion for the film and, and uh, conventions and whatnot. And uh, he's just, He's like no other. I mean, I don't, I don't know anybody to compare him to, because uh, he's such a um, raconteur. He, I mean, he just, he's, he's a conversationalist. You know, he loves to talk about things that he loves, and he loves things really intensely, and um, and he loves acting really intensely. Um, yeah, that just, I'm, I'm really, uh, I'm honored to be able to call him a friend. And then, and you have the uh, you have a sequel that's that was in the talks. Uh, is it still in the works of made, being made, or was it made uh, before the mask? I believe it was called before the mask, the return of Leslie Ber- Vernon. So yeah, it's it's we call it a a sprequel. It's kind of a remake. It's kind of a sequel. It's kind of a prequel. It's kind of a little bit of everything. It's playing with all those conventions. So. Uh, that's that's why we call it a sprequel. But uh, yeah, the script was written a number of years ago by David Stevie, and um, for a bunch of different reasons, uh, the ball, uh, get, you know, getting the ball rolling on on the sequel, mostly funding stuff. Um, it was kind of a herky jerky process, and and uh, things were laying dormant for a while. So I think Scott just got. Uh, Scott Glosserman, uh, the the exec producer, co-writer, and director, he uh, he decided to make a comic book of the sequel script. We just put out two weeks ago. We just put out the first two issues of a uh, six book series of the sequel script, <laughs> uh, which is a fun way to keep the ball rolling, uh, even if the film can't get off the ground yet, you know. Yeah, I saw uh, some I know what um, I mean. artwork from that, from that for the comic book, and it looks amazing. I have to get my hands on a copy of them. But uh, you, been, you did a it, lot of other work after, like, Beyond the Mask. You went ahead and you did a lot of television work and such and were in some films. And uh, you also did a lot of uh, production work with Star Wars, uh, Storage Wars. I'm sorry, I have an accent. Um, and uh, so you're keeping busy on a lot of things, it seems. Yeah, I've been working for a company called Original Productions, and uh, we've been kind of at the at the forefront of the quote unquote reality TV movement. We do uh, Deadly's Catch and Storage Wars, like you mentioned, and uh, Jay Leno's Garage and Axemen, Ice Road Truckers. Uh, you know, a whole bunch of those uh, cable programs and. Uh, um, so yeah, I've been fortunate to work for that company behind the camera for last six years or so. 
Wow. And that's gotten to be that's gotten to be quite the um, you know quite the market for programming like that. So yeah, that's really good that you've got the ball rolling in that direction as well. Yeah, well, I you know I didn't really have much of a choice initially because uh, uh, the 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 market for uh, for jobs uh, for acting was getting real. I mean, it was always competitive, but it got uh, really really. Um, you know, jobs just got sparse and, um, I wasn't auditioning for as much stuff. And, uh, the, 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 an opportunity to work for the company first came up as just a, you know, something to kind of fill, fill the time in between my next acting gig. Um, and then, uh, pretty soon it turned into, it turned into my, my full-time job. Um, cause, it was a really dynamic company and, and it was constantly growing and, um, and it was an opportunity to get involved in a whole uh, variety of aspects of, of production that I'd never had access to as, as a, you know, in front of the camera person. You know, with the um, like storage wars and uh, the reality shows, you're you're most like post uh, coordinator with the production and such. Um, have you you wrote, mm-hmm. did you ever write films, or did you ever get into the writing market of films or tel- television? Nothing that I've ever produced, but yeah, I've done, <laughs> I've done, written a lot of scripts. Uh, nothing that I would ever show anybody because they're not good. But um, but yeah, I felt at times like that was a way that I wanted to say what I had to say and it was a format that I was familiar with. So, uh, I've, I've taken a lot of creative, uh, pleasure in expressing myself that way. We need to put him in touch with Bud Cooper. Yeah. Bud's yeah, looking for a, a writer for his, uh, sequel to the mutilator. <laughs> so he's oh, yeah. advertising for that. <laughs> yep. I would, but, I would uh, not recommend myself, but there are a number of people that I, <laughs> I could recommend to him. But I follow your I follow your Facebook and I follow a lot of your posts and and you do do a lot of conventions on a convention scene. Um, when fans approach you, is it mostly because of uh, the Leslie Vernon role from Behind the Mask um, today, or is it a lot of your like a lot of your work all together? No, it's pretty much always Leslie Vernon. I mean, I went over actually I. Uh, what was it? Two nights ago, I went over to uh, in Burbank. There's a, a bookstore um, called Dark Delicacies um, that is just a, it's a staple for any horror fan. You have to go there. Um, and they were doing a book signing for Bruce Campbell. And uh, I was just gonna go meet up with a friend who who uh, was getting a book signed. Um, uh, I didn't want to go in. I, I didn't want to steal Bruce's thunder. Uh, I forget. <laughs> I think that a lot of people were paying to see him. So, um, yeah, I was just kind of standing around outside waiting for, um, waiting for my buddy and, uh, a whole bunch of people, their heads turned and their mouths opened and they were like pointing. It was a, it was a nice little ego boost. Everything I see you in, no matter if cameras and start taking selfies with you. Yeah. Yeah. I did. I did a couple, I did a couple selfies. Um, and uh, handed the camera off so that we could have somebody else, uh, you know, you got to make the shot look good, you know? Um, <laughs> yeah, but, uh, and, and, you know, chatted with some, some people who, who were fans of the film, you know, it, and it never, it never ceases to amaze me how many people uh, are, have been turned on by our work and, and, uh, and it just, yeah, it's, it's very pleasing to see how many people are, are fond of what we did and uh, and continue to be. And, uh, I, I think as, as a an fan, actor, that, you know, as an actor, that's yeah. the one thing you really want to shoot for deep down inside is, you know, that one thing that everybody remembers you for. Mm. Yeah, I got that. I, you know, I felt very, very, um, very much that when we finished the thing, um, I, I, I felt like I crossed my fingers, uh, you know, who knows what, what something is going to end up looking like in, in post-production with the editing process and all that stuff. You just, 
you never know. You just you do the best job you can and, and cross your fingers that it turns out okay. But as I was able to kind of look over the shoulders of the people who were working on it and, and the editing process and, um, you know, it 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 just got more and more exciting because I felt like, you know, we actually, you know, the script was fantastic to start out with. It was, it was, it was brilliant. It was kind of ours to screw up. <clears throat> and, and as the process went on, it, it felt like, okay, well, we're not really screwing it up. It feels like if anything, we're enhancing the script. So that's good. And then, you know, as the film was finished and, and we were screening it. I, I was like, this is it. I can, uh, this is my, this is my calling card. This is my, my hat stand. I can hang my hat on this and walk away. If, if I never get another opportunity again, um, this, this is, you know, going to be enough to be able to hand it to my kids and go, Hey, if, mm-hmm. if you, if you ever have an interest in taking a look at what, what your old man did, um, this, this is the thing to watch, you know? In watching uh, your work as a fan, in a fan's perspective, I see, like, when I watched the Leslie Vernon, I was hooked. I mean, I I watched, uh, I probably watched that film hundreds of times, one of my favorite films. And mm-hmm. I see you have that, that comedic approach. You have that horror approach. You could be scary. You could be funny. You could be serious. And just like Invasion, you could be serious. I mean, you could play any role. You're you're so much of a talent in the film business that you could actually chameleon yourself into any role. And um, that's something that I really, as a fan, I just point out and I see and I say, this guy is great. I mean, you brought um, when you brought the film uh, Beyond the Mask to life as Leslie Vernon, you didn't know what to expect. You were seeing this this normal guy, um, and into uh, the documentary being shot, and then the whole twist at the end, which I won't give away, but the the your acting ability in that film was amazing and just like what you did on in your television shows your, your appearances everything never fails to to be less than perfect you always give that perfect acting performance in your films oh gosh that's really flattering thank you i i put a lot um in in behind the masks terms i, I put a lot I, I put just about everything on the script i mean i was just kind of <laughs> i was just saying the words i was trying to you know, deliver them believably. And, um, and fortunately for me, there, there was a whole lot of range in the character that was written for me. Um, uh, I, you just, you know, that kind of an opportunity to play a character who has as many facets of interest as Leslie Vernon does, you know, you just never get that opportunity. Um, so many actor friends I have who, you know, they're brilliant. They're better than me, but I, I, you know, they just don't get that project that comes along that shows them off and and shows, shows them off in, in every way that they're um, capable of, of shining. And the script for me was an an unbelievable platform. It was a diving board, you know, (laughs) I could, it was, it, it was really springy and it was ready to deliver me where, wherever I was going to go. Um, and, uh, yeah, I got, I got to cover a lot of bases with that character and uh, serious and, and silly and intense and scary and even loving, just, you know, um, just not with that character, every character you play, even when you went ahead and you played and, uh, the, which one called the invasion? You did a great job as you are playing that role as well. I mean, you just you bring to life the character, and you don't really. It's like there's no you don't see no blemishes in it. You do just a good job in what you do when it comes to acting, and I'm sure you do a, a, an excellent job when it comes to producing. I mean, because your credits speak for itself. And but if there's a, a role that you want to play in film, is it horror or do you like? like comedy or do you like action or is there something that you really want to get into like dramatic roles or something? No, no, not really. I mean, I don't have any kind of preference for comedy or drama or horror or not. You know, I, I, when I was doing professional acting, I was just taking whatever gig came along, you know, it was noted. I 
done just about every cop drama that there is, you know, playing, you know, every, well, there's only one version of the bad guy, you know, it's, it's pretty much always the same. The bad guy's the same in every single one of those cop dramas, uh, or I'm, you know, the guy who you think did it, you know, the red herring. Um, and then you find out he didn't do it, but he's still a creep. He should probably still be behind bars, but, um, yeah, I've, I've done those characters. There's not tons of range in there. Um, but I've had a couple of projects that have allowed me to stretch and, uh, and I've been really fortunate to have had those opportunities. Um, I don't do prof- I haven't done professional acting in a long time. Um, I've been teaching mostly teaching acting. Um, wow. and that, that brings me a lot more, a lot more pleasure, um, than, than acting. I, I think because I'm, I'm of service to somebody else rather than the whole end all be all being of service to me, you know? And is there, is there anything coming forward that you want to promote and talk to about on that's coming about in your career? Um, well, we are, uh, my, my, I have an acting studio, Deviate Studios, and, um, we're gearing up for some production and I, I'm really excited about where it's going. I, I, I can't really talk about, um, specifics right now, but, um, but I'm really gratified to have a partner that is just as fired up as I am to tackle, um, tackle projects and engage actors in a way that they often don't get a chance to do in your standard acting classes, acting studio classes, um, where it's a kind of three hour exercise and you get up and you do a scene and you get a little criticism and then you sit down. Um, our, our goal is to get stuff up on its feet and get it produced and get it out there. Um, so that, uh, our students are not just training, but, they're uh, they're furthering their careers by having tangible material that they can, you know, show off. Uh, we also the the I, I mentioned the um, the comic book for the uh, sequel script for Behind the Mask that's out. We put out the first issues to subscribers uh, from an Indiegogo campaign that uh, allowed us to get the uh, production going on it. Um, so first couple of issues go out to them and then, uh, we're going to do a release of, uh, uh, another series that'll be, uh, available for the public for purchase. So, um, yeah, keep your eye out for that. So I was at Party City, um, I think it was the other day and I saw in their costumes, they have, they don't call it Leslie Vernon or behind the mask, but they have that whole costume that you wore in a film. No, um, so, you really? know, Yes, yeah, yes, in Party City down here in uh, Dixon City area, and it's oh, just strange because you That's see very you see these cost, you see these costumes <laughs> like Freddy like Freddy, and you see Jason, you see Michael Myers, but then you see the Leslie Vernon, and they don't say Leslie Vernon, they don't say behind the mask, but they're trying to slip it in there. But when you're a horror fan, sure. you're a fan of the film, you know what it's from, sure. and it, it's just yeah. uh, you could see that the the fans do see that have that passion and love that character and uh which i do well hey i don't, I don't in, know if you uh, thought the there was a there was a geico commercial that uh came out a year or two ago maybe um and it was it was the spit image you could tell that they were that they were riffing off of behind the mask which i i found tremendously flattering <laughs> um trick or treat studios actually puts out um uh, a mask and a scythe and um they do a fantastic job. I, I I know that they have their stuff for sale, but I've also heard that, um, and maybe it's through Trick or Treat that uh, Target has them, and you can find masks and whatnot on on Amazon. But uh, but yeah, the gear is out there, and every year, every Halloween, I get those uh, I get tagged in posts from folks who are dressing up or dressing their kids up as Leslie Burns. It's like, all right, we're keeping the Leslie level alive. I love it. There you yeah, go. And I, I think it's I think it's going to stay alive. I mean, I I actually I do consider you as part of when it comes to that that serial that monster movie serial killer theme. You have your Jasons, your Freddies, your Michaels, your Pinheads, and you have your Leslie Vernons. <laughs> so uh, I think you do have that that host of a lot of fans out there that do love your work and love your character and 
and just appreciate all you did for them by bringing that character to life in that film world. Well, that's an honor just to be a part of the conversation with those guys. I know you're short for time, and I wanted to thank you for being on the show today. It was an honor for us to, to, to talk to you. I mean, we're all huge fans of yours, and we look forward to all your future work. Um, is there any websites or anything you want to give a shout to and get them on the air for the listeners? Because we do have a lot of listeners today. Um, well, definitely, you know, go to go to Facebook and um, and go to the uh, Before the Mask, the Return of Leslie Vernon page. Uh, that's where we keep people updated uh, the moves that are going on with uh, the sequel and also with the um, the products, um, the merch, all that junk. Uh, um, people can get a heads up on on what's new and all that stuff. Um, and yeah, hopefully we'll have some news not too long from now. Mm-hmm. Uh, that the uh, sequel's getting off the ground. Um, in the meantime, if if you guys are ever out in L.A., uh, hit me up and we'll catch a beer. Beautiful. Sounds good. But, Nathan, once again, it's a great honor to talk to you, and thank you for coming on the show. I mean, you're an awesome guy. You do All your work is awesome, and we really appreciate that. What you brought to the film world and also the character of Leslie Vernon. Thanks, man. I appreciate that. I, I appreciate all of you and your interest in in this piece of work that we uh, that we loved doing, and um, and thanks for keeping keeping the ball rolling. Thank you. Thank you. And happy Halloween. You have a you thank have you. Have a happy Halloween, and you have a great evening, Nathan. And once again, thanks for joining us. My pleasure. You all do the same. Your dog, <laughs> but no, that was that was Nathan Basil. I mean, he is a, a great guy. I mean, it was a great show so far today. Oh yeah, and oh, uh, yes, so am I. Yeah. So, but anyway, how did you like today? How did you like our guests today? We had Bud Cooper. We had a special thing from uh, a special appearance from uh, the um. Uh, Ed Farrell, we had so many, we had some surprises, Nathan Basil. I mean, I think it was a great Halloween show so far. Oh, and yeah. uh, I know, yeah, I know um, Brandon had to step out. We lost Brandon earlier due to, uh, um, he had some things he had to take care of. So we're giving a shout out to our co-host, Brandon. Hope he, hope he takes care of him and we're, he'll be on next week's show. And speaking of next week, we have actor, producer, writer, a man who done it all in business. Uh, I mean, we were talking about Will Keenan. Um, those of you in the film world who know Will, he's playing in a lot of different films from Traumas, uh, Terra Firma, Tromeo and Juliet, Wicked Lake. I mean, uh, the list goes on. He now runs a, he has a church over in the Jersey area. I mean, I'm looking forward to that show, and that's next week at 9 p.m., where we will become K&S Society Talk Live. New name, but same old wacky host, but it will be, uh, well, we'll keep we're Will as a guest. <laughs> but um, how did you, uh, and I understand that Michelle has a lot of news that she would like to share with us today in uh, yes, the entertainment some- world. And uh, Michelle, <laughs> uh, you have a lot of you have a lot of good news that you want to share with us in the entertainment world today. So uh, I think we're going to just turn the mic over to you, and you can get started. Okay. Fat Domino, the rock and roll pioneer, passed away today at the age of 89. Um, he had hits like "I'm Walking." Blueberry Hill, Ain't That a Shame, and Blue Monday. All of the songs contain a simple melody, hip chord changes, a cool groove, and the key to a hit, simple lyrics. And Mr. Domino was very modest about his accomplishments. He once said, everybody started calling my music rock and roll, but it wasn't anything but the same rhythm and blues I was playing down in New Orleans. Fly free, fat, fly free. <laughs> subject about a problem that plagues my life. I have flowers. 
They are disrespectful to the opening and floors. I need a poo butler. So I need some smart people of the world to get together and design a Roomba-like thing that picks up poo and washes them off the carpets and floors. The ones right now just kind of smeared around all over the place. Thank you, thank you, thank you, Bunches. Also, Corpsman can't keep his name out of the news. With new claims that he will be planning to expose a Hollywood pedophile network in a YouTube video, Feldman says he wants to bring to light what is happening in the world of entertainment as far as perverts and pedophiles are concerned. He thinks life has become utter chaos since his announcement of his intentions. Days after his announcement, he was arrested for possession of marijuana. He caused the incident ironic. He described a near-death experience, by which I think he means attempted murder. He said two thugs came out of nowhere at him across a crosswalk, which is what he alleges. He claims several members of his band have quit because they are afraid for their lives. He has launched a fundraising campaign to support the creation of a film depicting the most honest and true vision of child abuse Hollywood has ever seen. In 2011, in an ABC Nightline interview, Feldman said, I can tell you, the problem in Hollywood was, is, and always will be pedophilia. That is the biggest problem for children in this industry. And he feels this is his mission in life. And that is the news. Mm, Boy, kind of rough. Yeah. I mean, I, you yeah. know, his band, no. in my opinion, you know, no. you know, he's, I, you know, I believe him, but with the band thing, you know, I just don't think music's his thing. So I don't know if that's really why they quit, but, <laughs> you know, it, it is a horrible thing that's going on right now in Hollywood with all of these accusations and everything that's, you know, pretty much flying around. And I'm kind of hoping, you know, that uh, everything is taken care of and cleaned up in the industry for children and adults alike. Uh, when the news about the Harvey Weinstein broke, my first reaction was, wow, a powerful Hollywood mogul caught being a, you know, power-hungry lech. I'm thinking, gee, you know, that's never mm-hmm. happened before. Uh, you know, are we surprised? Jeez. <laughs> oh, uh, One of those things, though, it's mm-hmm. always the bad apples, always raise the biggest stink in the barrel, that sort of thing. Mm-hmm. It was, that was, uh, like I say, in, in Hollywood, it's full of its, its darkness and a little bit of joy. Well, so there's but, always uh, going to be some darkness underneath the beauty. That's, you know, it's yeah. uh, part of what creates the art. And uh, or, uh, speaking of... To use, another, to use another term, you speaking, have to spread a lot of crap to get the roses to grow. Yeah. There you go. Speaking of beauty, uh, speaking of beauty, in November 29th show, we're going to be having Terry McMinn join us, and she was Pam from the original Texas Chainsaw Massacre, so she'll be joining us on the show. Um, we also will be having on November 15th, we'll be having Paul Ellers joining us. Um, he was from Madman, uh, another 80s slasher. Uh, he played Madman Mars, and I'm looking forward to that show as well. We also have on November 8th, we're going to be having WWE, well, WWF superstars back in the day. Nick Busick, who is Big Bully Busick, and Fred Ottman, who is Tugboat and Typhoon, and also the WCW time as the Shockmaster when he fell through the wall, which was one of the most notable times in pro wrestling. So they'll be joining us on one show. So that's going to be a great show. So I'm looking forward to them. And I really like the way Doc Society is taking off. And like I say, with this new switchover, becoming K&S Society and Talk Live, that's going to give a, a whole new range because we're always looking for the people in the music, the film, pro wrestling, anything entertainment is what we're looking for on this show. And I think we had a lot of great guests so far on the show uh, since we started our second season. Well, it's, it's yeah, definitely I'm... been very informative. Oh, most definitely, yeah. I was, I mean, it was great hearing Bud Cooper talk about what he went through as far as, uh, you know, producing the Mutilator and the, you know having those film students come in, you know, as a form of production crew, and then the money that he planned on spending versus what actually got spent to finally produce the film. 
Mm-hmm. Believe me, I'll be and sending in my copy of the. I'll be sending in my my email to Bud about uh, an idea for scripts. I mean, I think I still have one good film left in me to to there write out. To be, there has to be a hook to the vagina at some point in your script. I'm just saying, you need to keep that in there, <laughs> just to say in it, you know. Or at least a college to the, the fishing thing. Yeah. But um, no, but yeah, anyway, in the the world of haunts, since it's Halloween next week, um, how, like, explain your haunt, Lucian. Like, is it, um, like, the theme of the whole the haunt you do? Like, what is it all about? Well, uh, actually, the building that we're in contains not one but two haunts, actually. Uh, there's four, well, the first one is called Fort Harmony's Revenge, which is set in the small Kentucky town of Fort Harmony. And in the storyline, the storyline has changed a couple of times over the past past few years since I've been involved. But uh, our storyline this year is that uh, in the 1950s, uh, a coven of witches conducted a, uh, oh, a spell or what have you and uh, sacrificed a newborn baby to a demon. And the townspeople found out about this, and they caught the witch responsible, and she was burnt at the stake. But before she died, she cast a spell that uh, the people in the town would never be able to leave, and that it would be perpetual darkness 24-7. So uh, the people in the town gradually went crazy and, you know, are killers and cannibals and you name it. And not to mention the ghosts that are roaming the hallways, that sort of thing. And my character, uh, I play the curator of the Fort Harmony Historical Society, and I'm probably one of the la- one, one of three remaining sane people in town. In that I'm aware of what's been going on, and I'm also equally aware too that I can never leave. And so when people come in. Uh, I give them you know, a warning about what to expect along with two rules that they'll, they'll need to follow and then send them on their way. Uh, the, what other is haunt, uh, the other haunt is called, called Unit 732, and that's a, play, that's a play on an actual site called Unit 731, which was a uh, military research facility. Now, this, is, this is actually ties in... Uh, because we have a partner with another haunt in town called Asylum Haunted Screen Park, and they have an attraction called Zombie City. And like with so many zombie movies, they started out as a research facility and something went horribly wrong and you know, chaos reigned from there on. And this is sort of the prequel to Zombie City. In the... I, don't know what, I, guess my, I guess my burrito's done. <laughs> Um, but but uh, it's, a, it's a prequel of sorts to their attraction, Zombie City, in that uh, this haunt is actually set in the 80s. Uh, we have a actress who plays the receptionist there in the waiting room, and she's dressed like a refugee from a Cindy Lauper video. Uh, but, um, you know, you encounter, you know, various mad doctors and so on, and... Uh, Toward the end of this, tra- the end of Unit 732, as you're going through, you encounter the Wolf Pack, and this is a bunch of sort of, oh, uh, I guess for lack of a better term, sort of Mad Maxish uh, group of teenagers or whatever who are uh, taking control, and they, you're literally dodging them on the way out of the haunt. But uh, we've seen, you know it's a lot of action, that a lot of story really, driven. Really fun. Oh yeah, it is. It's great. Now, are you going to any haunts this year, Michelle? No, <laughs> I don't like to go in those those. It's dark and people like jump out at you. I don't I don't do that. <laughs> oh gee. I do want to give a. I do want to give a quick shout out to Devlin White's uh, Corpsewood Haunted Forest that's open Fridays and Saturdays. And on Halloween from 7 p.m. to 12 a.m. And that's at 4135 FM, 1563 Wolf City in Texas. 
Um, they have a great hunt going on there. I've been following a lot of their feeds and posts on that. And that looks pretty promising if you're in the Texas area. Me and myself, all we have is like Reaper's Revenge and we have the Asylum down here. But all the good haunts down this way have to go in the Scranton or the New York because we're branching to almost the New York area. And they have some good haunts in that area. But um, speaking of haunts, it, it, I, I think, it, well, it is, it's a small road trip to, to New York, but I'm, I, I want to go. But every year I say Fine. I want to go to these haunts and these haunted houses and these attractions, and I never do it. I, I never do. I just say I want to go to them, and I'm going to go to them, and, and every year something comes up, and I don't, and I can't go. But, I always end up um, getting dragged to one or another. <laughs> so I just like, where do I end up? I don't know. <laughs> Now, Lucy and Michelle, have you been following American Horror Story cult this year? I haven't had a chance to see any of it. I really haven't. It's my work schedule has just been. I just don't watch nearly the TV, nearly, nearly as much TV as I used to. Of course, to my wife uh, tends to monopolize it. <laughs> but uh, in, in, in my opinion, <laughs> I think it's in in my opinion, I think it's one of the best seasons that they have. Um, Michelle, I know you've been following it. What was your thoughts? I, yeah, I watched last it religiously. I was blown away at certain points. I, I just couldn't. I, I was in shock, you know, with what with his brother and what happened there. I was I was not expecting that. Um, I, I thought it was going to go quite the other way with who he let live and who he killed. So I thought it was going to go completely opposite. So and you could see so was, many, so many touches, so many touches of like the John Jones and uh, Charlie Manson and everything. So much in this absolutely. season. It and just, I'm looking forward to next season. next week. Yeah. Yeah, I saying that they, that never <laughs> ending with with the mask removal of the last person. That oh, was yes, just like that was, a twist. Um, that was a twist. That was a that was yeah. a big twist, and, and that's what this show does. It just twists and turns and twists and turns. You never know quite exactly where it's going to go. And I love that about it because I don't like predictable. I'm going to watch and it. I, I want that element of surprise. And I love I, I think that Kevin I'm Peters that. did it. Kevin Peters does a great job in this, this season. I mean, he does a paying Kai. He does a great job as that leader, that cult leader that makes you hate him, but yet you're intrigued and you want to know more about him and his, and his character. Exactly. I just really don't like that dingy blue hair, but you know. <laughs> no, he could do it out the blue hair, but I think I think I, I think it. did a great job. <laughs> I think yeah, but, so um, well acted. The, all of the actors are uh, they're just top for every see, season see, that they've had. The the one thing that um I was caught like off guard on was uh the the whole scenario when it came like at first you thought it was advertised as clowns and you thought the whole season was going to be about clowns and then yeah, you, uh, you're maybe. thinking politics you thought it was all about politics between the the, the politics era that we're in now but it ended up being more or less that the they took the principles of it all with the hate and the way things are going in the world and they developed this whole unique scenario and with, with twisting it was just, twisting her Brilliant. And Rick, Rick Springfield even made an appearance last night, the the singer Rick Spring, Springfield, when he played that um, sadistic um, priest. Mm-hmm. That was oh, that was him. I, I mean, that, yep. But, yeah. I, I, didn't, I didn't look at that part of it. <laughs> I didn't notice who played it. I was just, yeah. like I said, I was just like, oh, my, my jaw dropped kind of. And every episode's been like that. And I know a lot of people in the beginning, oh, there's clowns. Boom, they're done. And they, and they didn't want to watch it it's just because there was clowns in it. And I stuck with it. I, I'm, not a big, I'm not a big clown fan, as everyone knows. No. But I, I stuck with it, and I watched every single season. So I'm like, yes, I'm still watching it. And no, that, I'm just in no, awe. No. I, it's a, the brilliance in writing, the brilliance in acting. Uh, this is one of the very best well-made shows I have ever seen. I mean, it's it's definitely a, in my top ten for sure. And well, last year we were kind of like it was kind of like iffy. Uh, I didn't know how to take it when I watched the uh, last season um, with Roanoke. Um, I did like a, some things about it, but I was kind of skeptical when they didn't keep in this season. They didn't keep like Kathy Bates, or they didn't keep uh, 
Jay, like, they keep a lot of the big names, but I was uh, well, watching them. I'm a bit surprised. I think it has to do with budget. You know, I think it has to do a little mm-hmm. bit with budget and also building up the other actors that are, they're a little bit, they, some of them seem to be a little less known, but they have had big roles in other films as well. So, you mm-hmm. know, in other shows and other films that I've seen. So I just think it's it's good to build those characters, but I think a lot of it comes down to budget. I mean, you can't, uh, you can't have a blockbuster actor for every single role all of the time. And yeah, that makes, that makes perfect two, sense. The same actors and, um, that have used throughout though. So, and, and that's been a theme that they've done, which I love because it's a different story every season, but a lot of the same faces. So I, I love that. And I'm hoping though I'm hoping like next season they bring in some of some bring some of those actors back. Yeah, I love to see Jessica Lang make an appearance back. Absolutely. And have you, you followed the American Horror Story, right, Lucy? And I know you don't watch it as much now, but you do catch up on it and follow it as it as time as you do get the time. Yeah, I, yeah, I think uh I think Jessica Lang sort of felt that she was getting oh sort of tight cast. Uh, from appearing on the show, and that's why she dropped out. That was more of her own choice. Uh, as far as Kathy Bates, I don't think I exactly heard any particulars as to why she left. I mean, I know she's got her new series on Netflix that she's appearing in. Uh, the title escapes me right now, but it deals with marijuana. Um, oh, that, that is a, it, that's a hysterical show also. If you haven't ca- caught that one yet, you have to watch it. It was uh, really funny. What is that called? Um, oh, God, I can't remember the name. It's an easy name, too. <laughs> Set me up with it later, and I'll put it on my Facebook yeah. for everybody. But uh, and, uh, let me see if I can pull it up here on uh, the data thing. But anyway, yeah, if you didn't catch that, watch that. And um, another show that um, – oh, let's go back to American Horror Story. Billy Lord, who who is in American Horror Story, um, which, I mean, she does a great job. But the thing is, is I – the character she plays, if you watch like uh, Screen Queens and that, when she plays that that soft-spoken girl, the, it, it kind of goes into this character, which uh, I'm trying to like, that's what I'm trying to, to get a feel around. It's like they, they kind of keep her in that same uh, mild characteristic mode, the way she she speaks and she acts and everything, because um, she's similar to her character in Screen Queens. That's That's my opinion anyway. It, they it seemed like yeah they they kind of typecast it a little bit but at least they they took they didn't put the earmuffs on her so <laughs> 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 I loved Screen Queens I I loved that show so I was a big fan of that one as well and uh, what other then shows uh, what's been back in in November we've got o- Oak Islands coming back on the History Channel I love that show I'm a big huge fan uh, I've been fascinated with the the mysteries of Oak Island. Since I was a this, child, so <laughs> it's uh, really kind of that was what. Dis, I'm sorry to cut you off, but it's disjointed with Kathy Bates on Netflix. I just want to say it slips up my mind again. <laughs> ah, thank you. Now Oak Island isn't that the isn't that the place where like Blackbeard is supposedly buried treasure and uh, all the well, other mysterious know. things. They're thinking it, it, one of the possibilities is it's of the Knights Templar. Uh, buried a treasure, which uh, could be uh, manuscripts. It could be uh, you know, manuscripts from William Shakespeare is one of the theories um, that it's a Knights Templar cache of you know, gold and things like that, or that it's got the chalice from from Jesus Christ, that it's got the Ark of the Covenant. Uh, there are many different theories of what's down there, but it's um, the money pit they've had, like we're, people have gone for hundreds of years and tried to dig down this hole and it keeps, it has like channels filled with water and there's, they make it down so many levels and it, it falls apart. They've had a, a lot of deaths. There's legends to do with the deaths that they need one, one more person to die and then the mystery will be solved. So there's, uh, it, it's creepy and it's cool. And it's one of the things when I was a child that uh, it really kind of opened my eyes to the mysteries of the world and it made me, seek out some of the uh, more unexplained things of the world just because that is a, that is the stuff where dreams are made. That is where creativity comes from when you're intrigued and 
you have something to build your curiosity, your natural curiosity. And, and for me, I'm fascinated. I want to know what's down there. I want, you know, and it's, it's, they spend so much money trying to figure out just even to dig holes to put cameras in to try to find if there's anything down there, you know, in anything they find, I don't care if it's a rock, if it's one little ring, one little gold coin, it, it tells a story. And, and so far, I mean, if anybody has been watching this, there's so much weird evidence down there that it, it could be, you know, there's, there's coins that date back. I think there's probably ones that are earlier, but I'm, I know I'm remembering 1400s. I'm not mistaken. Uh, so, they're finding old things, so it could be pirates. And they're, the way they built these traps with coconut fibers, it's really very, it's very intricate. And to reverse engineer this is quite difficult after you know centuries, a uh, century of people trying to dig it and then just plowing it back over and making a mess of the site, so nothing is intact and original. So it does make it difficult, but it's a fascinating show if you're into those kind of things. Speaking of... I'll definitely uh, tune into that. I mean, I love that kind of stuff. Speaking of historical things of that nature and weird happenings, uh, there's also a movie coming out that I think everybody will really, really want to catch. It's called Winchester, The House That Ghost Built. And uh, this is going to have actress Helen Mirren, and she's going to be playing the widow of the uh, creator of the Winchester Rifle. And if you're not oh, familiar I'm with the story, house. yeah, if you're not familiar with the story of the Winchester House, uh, this mansion was like seven stories tall and occupied several acres, and she, it was she had it built on the recommendations of a of a uh, psychic, who told her that uh, she would be forever haunted by the ghosts of all the people killed by Winchester rifles, unless she built this house to accommodate the spirit. And you have things throughout this house like rooms with 13 walls, windows with 13 panes of glass, uh, stairs that lead up to the ceiling and go no further. Uh, there's a flight of stairs that basically just sort of takes you around in a circle, doesn't take you anywhere at all. And this is just, you know, built, you know, basically to, to keep the ghost occupied. That's gonna be something. That's gonna be interesting. I think I saw like little teasers and trailers and that stuff on um, the the Facebook posts and such. I gotta follow more oh, up yeah. on that one. You know what? Also, I've been looking forward to is that Suburban Con. That's gonna be coming out at the theaters. Have you heard oh, about that film George... yet? Matt Damon, Matt Damon, George Clooney. Uh, I haven't heard too much about that in advance. I mean, I've I've heard of it, but I have, I'm not uh, all that familiar with what's going on. Yeah, no, but it's uh, if you it goes like it has that fifty setting, you know that um, that perfect uh, setting you see back in those TV shows like Father Knows Best and uh, quiet urban suburban type of setting, but it's like a thriller mystery, but it has that that horror sense to it, and it mm. looks like it's gonna do. It looks like it's gonna be pretty interesting to watch, and I just I don't know. I saw that the the trailers to it. And really, what really caught me was the idea of the to be brought into that com- suburban community and have that that crime and people just going like to to me what I see in the trailers people just going like crazy and just killing people and it's uh, that that murder that that drama behind it the horror and I think it could be something that's different that's gonna hit and that's and plus it's rated R so I mean finally we get a good rated R film in that bracket that we can enjoy. Um, and I finally watched that um, Happy Death Day, which I have to oh. say, I was skeptical watching it. I mean, it kept going, but I really, as you're watching it, you really do appreciate it because it brings in that whole, the, the premise that it has a purpose. It's like people watch say, oh, it's going to be like Groundhog Day and, and such, where it's going to keep going on and on and on. But it doesn't. It really has that good plot to it and a good twist that... Um, she has to find like find out who's after her, who the killer is, that who done it prem um has some good kill scenes, but I wish it wasn't um as toned down as it was. I wish it had that gore because it would have been a really fun movie if they really didn't hold back on that. 
So, Again, too, you, you, the, the films that have a lot of gore, uh, the main thing about the movie biz these days, it's, you know, how many butts can you put in seats? And if they <laughs> go with the higher, you know, the R rating, for example, that reduces the chances of getting the PG-13, the PG crowd in there. Uh, so, you know, that's probably don't see that many high gore films, you know, getting major theatrical releases anymore. I mean, how many times do you see like the uh, theaters IDing people? I mean, when you're going to a movie theater, I, I never see them con someone. It's always buy a ticket and go. And it could be a teenager. You know, it's a teenager. You know, it's under the the whole thirteen or uh, the over the whole th- under the thirteen, under the sixteen. Still put into the the Ovid films. But when films come out, when especially horror, my concept is, yeah, PG-13 would bring in a good audience of younger people, but it takes away to the whole premise of being a horror film. Um, back in the 80s, when did you ever see, or even in the early 90s, so when did you ever see a PG-13 horror film? And I, just, I want I want to see. I want to see a horror film. I don't want to see something watered down. And I think Happy Death Day was great, but it was watered down, and there was so much that they could do if they would have let loose and showed it all. If you stop to think about it, uh, back in the 80s, you had Gremlins, which, for all intents and purposes, was a horror movie. I mean, you had monsters running around, wreaking all manner of havoc. And that's what the PG-13 rating was created for, basically uh, basically to uh, placate Steven Spielberg, because supposedly Gremlins was originally going to get slapped with an R rating. And Spielberg had enough cool at the time, like, no, you know, there's, you've got to do something about it. Well, yeah, I see, I see the, the premise there. It's just that when they take films like... Um, for example, there was like the the fog, or we have uh, Happy Death Day, and we have films that have that potential that people are like, oh, a good slasher film, or oh, a good horror film, but then they say PG thirteen. It kind of turns me off to that because I know I'm going to go in, and they're going to hold back on this, the 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 blood. They'll have the jump scares, but they won't have that that premise of gore that you like. You, know, you want to see not not just gore. I mean, I'm just talking about um, horror in general when it comes to violence and, and, and what scares you and what begs a horror film, the tone of it all. They kind of water it down. And, and I'm just, I'm all against the PG-13 fraction. If it's horror, uh, I can understand if it's mild like Gremlins was. And to a kid, it would be scary, but it was it was a good family, like uh, fun film to watch Gremlins was. And I see the PG-13 rating there, but when it comes to something like Happy Death Day or something uh, I, I, w- I would like to see more horror and more R rating in that. That's what made it was it being rated R. I think that really drew a lot of good people to it, an audience. Oh. And look how big that film came. That was rated R, and that made it perfectly. Mm-hmm. Oh yeah, I mean, well, so, I mean, it is officially the highest, you know, the highest grossing R rated film of all time now. So mm-hmm. that says a lot right there. So. But anyway, today we had a great show. We had Buddy Cooper, the writer-director of The Mutilator, that joined us in the for the show. Um, we had Ed Farrell, who is the special effects, also one of the special effects guys on the, the show, The Mutilator, the movie The Mutilator from the 80s. And we also were joined by Nathan Basil from Behind the Mask and um, TV show The Invasion and a lot of other great films. And next week we are going to be joined by... Will Keenan, who did a lot of films for Trauma, a lot of motion pictures, a lot of television shows, producer, writer, director, you name it, he's done it. He'll be joining us next week for a good show. And as always, it was great to have you guys on board. And, I mean, I love just coming together and talking films and entertainment. Feelings mutual. So, Loving Michelle. <laughs> Michelle, you're awesome. Lucian, you're awesome. And also, Brandon, if you're listening, thanks for joining us for the first hour. We hope all is well, and we'll see, hear from you next week. Love but, you, brother. Um, but it was a great show, and as always, 
all your listeners out there. We had a lot of good listeners out there. Um, all your listeners, thank you for tuning in to Doc Society Entertainment Talk Live. Happy and Halloween, you everybody. Have a great evening. Happy Halloween. Happy Halloween. Birds and basket weavers who sit and smile and twiddle their thumbs and toes and they're coming to save me.